We're going to continue talking about the CNS physiology. We said that the average cerebral blood flow, or the normal cerebral blood flow, for the average adult brain is approximately 50 ml of blood for every 100 grams of brain tissue per minute. And if you were to calculate that the average adult brain is about 1,500 grams, we can conclude and say that the cerebral blood flow for the average adult brain is approximately 750 ml of blood per minute. To further clarify cerebral ischemia, we can say that cerebral ischemia generally takes place when the cerebral blood flow falls to approximately 20 to 25 mLs of blood for every 100 grams of brain tissue per minute. And if you were to say that the average brain tissue is approximately 1,500 grams, we can calculate and say that generally cerebral ischemia takes place when the cerebral blood flow is approximately 300 to 375 mLs of blood per minute. And we can also say that the EEG generally shows signs of ischemia or an isoelectric flat line on the EEG when the cerebral blood flow is approximately 225 to 300 mLs of blood per minute. And if the cerebral blood flow falls below 10 mLs of blood for every 100 grams of brain tissue per minute, which equates to approximately less than 150 mLs of blood per minute, the brain will suffer from irreversible brain damage and permanent neurological dysfunction. Now, we can look at the monitoring devices and modalities that can be used perioperatively in hopes to reduce the chances of cerebral ischemia, or if by chance cerebral ischemia does take place, uh, it gives us an indication that it's occurring so that we can prevent the further worsening of cerebral ischemia. So certain modalities are, for example, keeping a patient awake so that we can monitor the cognitive function as well as to, to sense any neurological dysfunction that's taking place. We can use an EEG, evoke potentials, we can monitor the intracranial pressure, we can use a transcranial Doppler, and we can look at different modalities to evaluate the oxygenation that takes place within the brain tissue. So for example, we can have a patient awake and ask them to move their extremities in hopes to see if there's any uh, neurological impairment that's taking place. An EEG measures the brain activity in the form of hertz. And the degree of hertz or the measurement of hertz gives us an indication of what type of brain activity is taking place, what type of brainwave activity is taking place. And certain indications that warrant an EEG monitoring would be, for example, doing a case of cerebral aneurysm, or perhaps a carotid end arterectomy, a cabbage, or repair of an AV malformation. We can also monitor evoked potentials, for example, a visual uh, evoked potential, in hopes to monitor the cranial nerve number two, the optic nerve. For example, if you are doing a um, surgery on the pituitary tumor, which is close to the optic chiasm, and you can see if there's any neurological impairment that's taking place as you're working on the pituitary nerve a pituitary gland, rather. You can monitor the somatosensory evoked potentials, and that basically helps to evaluate the integrity of the neuropathway, for example, from a peripheral nerve, such as the median nerve, as it goes into the dorsal root ganglion, up into the spinal cord through the posterior columns, decusates across the medulla oblongata to eventually going to the contralateral cerebral cortex. So monitoring the somatosensory evoked potential helps to monitor the integrity throughout that whole pathway, neurological pathway. You can monitor the brainstem auditory evoked potential, and that helps to monitor the cranial nerve number 8 as you're working on the brainstem, perhaps there's a tumor in the brainstem. Or, for example, you can monitor the motor evoked potentials that generally 
uh, helps to evaluate the integrity of the anterior column of the spinal cord. Likewise, we can monitor the intracranial pressure in hopes to get a further understanding of the cerebral perfusion pressure, for example, on a closed head injury or a case that requires uh, resection of a large brain tumor. Other examples would be a ruptured aneurysm, cerebral aneurysm, a cerebral vascular occlusive disease, or a patient who has hydrocephalus. You can monitor the transcranial Doppler to see the actual flow or to sense the actual flow that's taking place within the vasculature of the uh, brain, or certain modalities of oxygenation, such as the brain tissue oxygenation, or uh, measuring the oxygenation within the jugular bulb venous uh, sinuses. And you can also measure the transcranial oxygenation. These are all monitoring devices in hopes to prevent cerebral ischemia, and if cerebral ischemia were to take place, hopefully uh, see the signs of cerebral ischemia so that it is corrected before any permanent neurological function takes place. In the next lecture, we'll talk about more of the treatment aspect of cerebral ischemia and the difference between the global and the focal cerebral ischemia.